everyone for coming. Um, this is the event organised by Burbeck Stop the War in coalition with um, various other societies, London Guantanamo um, Campaign and also I Engage. We're privileged today to be joined with uh, Dennis Edney QC, who is a Canadian lawyer who has been involved in landmark cases both in the US Supreme Court and in the Canadian Supreme Court. He has, he has received various awards for his work. Um, he will be appointed by the um, he was appointed by the U.S. Pentagon to represent Omar Kada in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Thank you. I just don't know how to approach this right now. There's a scattering of you here. We could talk, or I can. I had prepared. Welcome. Thank you. Do you. I presume, rightly or wrongly, that you all know about Guantanamo Bay. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Students get up and rebel, <laughs> scream, throw bricks, smash windows. Yeah. Thank you. And do you know about a young man, a young Muslim boy called Omar Khadr? Is that a yes? Yeah. See, I'd be a tough professor for me. <laughs> I do lecture, I do teach law, and um, I make students answer. I want to fight me. Well, you know, I drafted a talk, and um, so I'll give you my. I, I I want to respect you for being here. So here's how I'll start. There was a there was a time, not so long ago, when we didn't understand what was meant by the phrase the rule of law. Over recent years, fortified by concerns between the relationship between the rule of law, human rights, and civil liberties on the one hand, and security on the other, interest in the subject has continued to grow. It is, a, however, still a naughty issue. And by naughty, I don't mean any U G H T Y. I mean like a knot. It's a knotty problem. Since parliamentary supremacy and the rule of law are said to be two fundamental principles underlying our constitutions. So when I say it's a naughty problem, since parliamentary supremacy and the rule of law are, are, are said to be two fundamental principles underlying our constitutions. But they are not harmonious bedfellows. They're, they're at odds with each other. For example, and I was intent to digress, I appeared in the US Supreme Court in 2004 in the case of Rousseau versus Bush. And this was the early years of Guantanamo Bay, the very dark, dark years. Not that they've gotten better, but I've been going there for many years. One of the very few people we ever meet. And so in 2004, what we did, we demanded something that day by, dates back hundreds of years. We said, you can't lock up these children, you can't, can't lock up these male human beings, and not bring them before a court of law and have their and be advised of why they're being locked away in indefinite detention on a place that's remote. 
and the Supreme Court of the United States agreed. So there was a rule of law being applied, except that wonderful president, um, George Bush, he passed legislation that, owed, that eviscerated the, um, the ruling by the Supreme Court. So that's the tension I talked to you about between rule of law, as we understand it, being a difficult bedfellow of Parliament, meaning depending upon which government's in power, they have the power to pass legislation. Legislation trumps everything. And back in those times, back in 2002, which was the start of Guantanamo, at that particular time, Madeleine Albright, who was the former U.S. Secretary of State, in giving a speech, stated these words. We have found, and she's speaking on behalf of the American government, to a world audience. And what she said, we in America have found, through experience around the world, that the best way to defeat terrorist threats is to increase law enforcement capabilities while at the same time promoting democracy and human rights. And those remarks at that time would have struck many liberal, Western liberal democracies at that time as orthodox, as consistent with their understanding, consistent with their values, consistent with the rule of law as they understood it. And we would have a certain pride about being able to stand up and say, we uphold the rule of law and we believe in human rights. 2002. Now, since then, many Western democracies, including Britain, certainly the United States, and many other Western democracies, have reappraised that orthodox approach described by Margaret, Adam Albright. On the international play in 2005, the Bush administration rejected an approach consistent with the rule of law. In setting out its national defence strategy, the Pentagon warned that our strength as a nation, talking about America, will continue to be challenged. That is, we'll have problems with these alleged terrorists. And be challenged by those who em employ a strategy of the weak using international media and judicial processes. So essentially what Bush was saying, law shouldn't interfere whatsoever. Um, you're not entitled to day in court. We know what's better. We are keeping you all safe. And as silly as that may seem to you, or as weird as it may seem to you, I was in this southern district of San Francisco in the early days of the challenge leading up to the Supreme Court. And the argument made before the, this, the second district was the same argument that was made in the U.S. Supreme Court. We know better. We know how to keep you safe. And if we put these people in Guantanamo Bay and lock them away, and if we should summarily execute them, that's none of your business. We know better. In fact, a judge of the, of the second district in San Francisco, um, I recall his comment was, in all his years on the bench, he had never ever heard such language coming from the Department of Justice. You're a lawyer, you're a lawyer, you're a lawyer, you're trained, your fundamental training is to uphold the rule of law. What distinguishes me from being a businessman as a lawyer is my commitment to justice. But the Americans weren't only seeing that. The mood had also changed in Britain. Tony Blair 
at his monthly press conference on August the 5th of 2005 said, Let there be no doubt, the rules of the game have changed. Well, this was not perhaps a happy choice of phrase, since no responsible person had ever supposed that what was going on was simply a game. But at least, but Mr. Blair can at least claim the virtue of consistency. On the point of leaving office, in an article published on May 27th of 2007, he described it as dangerous misjudgment to put civil liberties first. He said, to do so is to be misguided. and wrong. So other Western leaders, whether well it's Canada, have quoted Cicero's mis much misquoted phrase that the safety of the people is the supreme law. They quote that to their own advantage. They quote that to be able to have more control over society and they quote that in order to suspend civil liberties. And this kind of view that, look, don't worry about anything, we'll keep you safe, just let us get on with the business, is one, in my experience, has found great support in democracies such as the United States. In fact, I, I, I give this, when I always go off tangent, I give this little comment of when I was, I was in Chicago one time, on my way to or fro from somewhere, and really tired, and I like to listen to talk shows, radio talk shows, and so I'm, I'm addicted to them, actually. I love listening to what people say. And so this woman called in one day, one morning, and she said, do you know, this is Chicago, mind you. The Taliban has been infiltrating um, school bus drivers in Chicago. Now, if I had been holding that talk show, what I'd be, I would have been kind to that lady. I'd have said to her, thanks for your opinion, stay on the meds, and um, talk to you later. <laughs> but nothing happened. It just opened the door for all other kinds of people calling in. And the, and the overwhelming theme was, you, pr you government promised to keep us safe. And how could that be happening? That is the Faustian deal that many peoples have in this country, in other countries, particularly in America is that we allow, we allow you government to get, go on and protect us. We don't give a shit about anybody else. Just, we don't know what this rule of law crap is. You take care of us and we'll leave you alone. Which is why there's been so many abuses in the United States since 2002. So why Muslims by the battle load have been picked up and locked away for a year then suddenly let loose. I dealt with three particular, I'm way off the tangent here, I dealt with three particular individuals, one was a Canadian kid and two were others, who were picked up, locked away, a year to the date they went missing. One was found on a motorway, one was found on the border, they just get dropped at different places. It's time to be free. And we, what I try to do is to get these individuals to sign up so we could sue the American government, but they didn't want to do that. And quite rightly to some extent. What they wanted to do was get on with their own life. Even though they'd done nothing, they didn't want to be bothered. I was a little basketball kid that went across the border just to see a basketball game. And so, I give you those examples to give you a sense of the trade-off that we have made since 2002. But I suggest to you that the more preferable view is the one attributed to Benjamin Franklin, who stated that he 
who would put security before liberty, deserves neither. So as I take you through the Omar Khadr story, it's an extensive story, we'd be here for days. So I'm trying to quickly take you through it. I know you kids have got short attention spans. I was going to show you my baby pictures first, but I thought I'd leave them to another time. Okay? If there's one essential principle I'd ask you to take away from my talk, is that governments may not use indiscriminate measures, which would only undermine the fundamental values which your mums and dads and your grandfathers and grandparents struggle for. We're turning back the clock. So, I will tell you a little bit about Omar. Omar Khadr spent over 10 years in U.S. custody in Guantanamo Bay before being finally transferred to a Canadian prison, where he still is today. And at 15 years of age, he should never be on the battlefield because his father placed him there with a bunch of hard-nosed, half a dozen actually, Taliban warriors in a, in a house. And Omar had no choice but to be there. He went, he, uh, if he had stood up against his father, or stood up against that, um, those Taliban warriors, some whom I'm knowledgeable of, all dead, he would have been killed. I remember saying, no, my boy, just run away. And he said, if I'd gone to a village and they'd taken me in, they would have been dis offending my father, and there would have been bloodshed. He had no choice. And he was in that compound for about six weeks when U.S. forces surrounded the compound and a siege took place for about several hours. And as a Delta Force officer described it, it was a mess. Because the American army is full of reservists, that's weekend warriors, what I call weekend warriors. But, um, and they're full of them, man. Because what is America, God bless their hum human humanity and commitment to the rule of law, as Madeleine Albright talked about, because they've only been in 40 wars in 20 years. Such major countries that fought, such as Grenada. I've been to Grenada. You can get a soccer ball from one side to the other. And so, I, and so that battle wasn't going well for these reservists. And so they called in Apache helicopters, and they called in two bombers, we dropped two 500 pound bombs on this house. In fact, the shelling was so intense that military reports that I reviewed said that there was no way that anyone could have survived. And then, they, then an assault group moved into the compound with throwing hand grenades, firing guns all over the place. And a Delta Force soldier called Christopher Spear got killed by a hand grenade. In the meantime, Omar Khadr, there was this Delta Force officer. The Delta Force is like your SAS. Americans don't even acknowledge that there's such a body. Uh, I spent a day, maybe two days actually, two different Delta Force guys talking to him, and particularly the one that killed the shot Omar Khadr. And what he said was that you know, he went down this alley looking for bodies, he saw what he said was a Taliban, so he shot him. And he saw this kid, which is Omar Khadr, 15 years of age, who was screaming. His body is to the so advancing soldiers. He has um, been hit by all, his head and body has been terribly damaged. At, um, he's, his eyesight is, is burning. He's just a mess. Thank you. And that soldier shot him twice in the back. In fact, his bullet wounds are like this. And that, that is a war crime. Because under the law of war, you may not kill a wounded enemy who is no longer in the fight. And that's not some nice little human rights kind of phrase I'm making. Since the Second World War, now I'm off tangent again. 
Since the Second World War, we've put in place rules and regulations to avoid horrors. If you want to fight me, or fight on the battlefield, fine. But when they're wounded, we don't do horrible stuff. We don't go beyond the battlefield. Today, we don't even know what a battlefield is. We send drones into Pakistan and shoot villages. We kill, we kill hostages. We don't keep hostages. And we pick up people off the battlefield and put them in place in the bag of them and Guantanamo and we touch them. And soldiers that I know, officers, trained in the law of war, what do they tell you? Not only are they ashamed of where we've gone today, but they say their, their safety is also threatened. Because if I'm not following the rules, then why should you follow? And so we become more lawless today, notwithstanding all the language you hear from our politicians. I'll save that talk for another day. And so, so it was in these conditions then the U.S. authorities accused Omar Khadr of having thrown a hand grenade, and but he's sitting on the ground. Sustained multiple wounds to his head and body. He's got blinding shrapnel wounds to his, his eyes. He's, his back is to this the oncoming soldiers. And he is, as the prosecution made out, he was able to throw a hand grenade over his shoulder, try it when you go home, that flew over an eight foot wall and continued on for another 80 feet. We've actually had fun with this, sadly, as I, I gotta have a bit of humor. Well, I remember one time in Guantanamo on the beach, we had these soldiers and we'd pick up the, the youngest and the fittest soldier and we'd promise them all kinds of presents. They could just throw this hand grenade eight feet over this post and we'd have somebody out to catch it. And we tried to keep it. We got anywhere near that. But that's right. And there's no evidence as to what type of hand grenade killed Christopher Spear. Because the Taliban were using a Japanese model, and the Americans, of course, are using their own destructive model. Okay? The only evidence that they had a trial, and if you're a criminal lawyer, and someone, if you're a lawyer like me, and someone, if I wasn't a lawyer, and someone told me this, I'd never believe them. I think they'd be drinking before they came to talk. Okay. The only evidence they had a trial was a piece of shrapnel that they took from the body of another soldier six years after who's still alive, okay, and they said, well, look at this shrapnel. But, uh, so that must be the same kind of shrapnel that killed Christopher Spear. That was the quality of evidence they had. And of course, there's no eyewitness that saw Omar fire a weapon or otherwise engage in hostilities. And. And also, the, one of the other arguments was that God, the prosecutor said, well, it must have been him in any event because he was the last man standing. And that's what we all thought, that he was the last survivor. And because when, you, when you're in a battle, uh, when, the, when, the, when it's over, the chap in charge, the colonel, the general, whoever, he's supposed to write reports. And so I had his report. And his report said, last man standing on my car. And a trial, so called trial. You can't be the stuff up, by the way. A, a sergeant in, in the office was told to hand out these press briefs to different people. In Guantanamo for the trial, there were people from all over the world coming with a limited amount come and observe. And so they were given these press clippings, right? except they weren't press clippings. It was Major Watts' real report. And the report said there had been another Taliban shooting at them after the Sakata got shot. He picked up the wrong document that had been hidden from us. He brought that before the wonderful judge. He didn't seem to understand the importance of that. So the entire case against Omar Khadr 
is based upon self-confessed statements that he made in background, in the hospital in background, in the cages in background, and in that hellhole called Guantanamo. And those statements were made through years of coercive, uncounseled, and abusive interrogations that began from the moment he regained consciousness on a bed in a prison hospital. And I say to you that what I'm saying to you, and I know it doesn't come surprise to you, but maybe to others, those descriptors should come as no surprise to anybody here. Because it was in January of 2002 that most of you, and certainly your parents, your uncles, your aunties, your grandparents, your friends, saw on TV those first shocking images of human beings in rows, in aircraft, hooded, shackled for transportation across the Atlantic, much as historically other human beings had been carried in slave ships 400 years earlier. Because you remember what we saw, we witnessed those captives humiliated at looking at anonymous human beings in these cages and loaded at Guantanamo Bay and crouched in open, crouched in open cages in orange jumpsuits. You remember all that image? All deliberately displayed for you and I and for the rest of the world to see. And for us, the watching world, no knowledge of law, no knowledge of, inter of international humanitarian conventions was needed to understand what we were watching was illegal. This was not a manif manifestation of the Geneva Conventions, nor was it an act of deportation or extradition. It truly was far worse. It was the unlawful transportation to a world outside the reach of the law and intended to remain so. So I gave you those dates of George Bush, 2005, played in 2007, saying it's not a game anymore and the gloves are off. Gloves are off long before then. And they knew that as in my Canadian government. And in that world, crimes against humanity would be carried out and continue to do so. The place hasn't closed. It's just off the radar. It's off the radar, particularly here in this country. Why should we worry about it? It changed someone else's problem. And it's never someone else's problem. It's your problem the day when you get picked up and no one's there to defend you. It's your problem when you get picked up and get locked away for weeks. It's your problem when you cross a border and someone decides to pick you up, throw you in jail, and then someone else thinks you may have some intelligence value. I spend years in and out of secret, secret um, courts. And I can talk about intelligence. I've never seen any. If you think it's, if you think it tells you where, where I used to say that, if you think it tells you where. Osama bin Laden lives, fine. It doesn't. It's seventh and eighth and it's you talk to your sister, we talk to a friend, we pass something else off and someone interprets it. That's intelligence, generally. So it's that kind of stuff and those kind of authorities that we have that makes not any one of you safe. Not one single person. And amongst them in that hellhole was Omar Kara, 15 years of age. How old are you, madam? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. 20. 20. You got a brother, a sister, a young brother? Visualize your young sister. Visualize your young brother. Visualize yourself at 15. When Omar woke up in Guantanamo, when in background with all his injuries, little did he know 
his trouble was just starting. He he was in such pain when he was found by these soldiers still to be alive. But he asked them to shoot him. Now that language has been used as a way of showing you what a radical this 15 year old was. I have seen his body many times. I, in fact, he's in hospital right now. I've seen the damage he still suffers from, despite his great good nature. And if I had been in the pain he had, we wouldn't have cried to get put out of him. But what did we do? We put him under questioning in background based upon the records we looked at at least 20 to 25 times. And his principal interrogator was a guy called Joshua Claus. And some of you may even know who he is without knowing that. Do you ever, I play professor, put your hands up. If you, do you recall the images of the U.S. interrogators in the Abu Ghraib prison in Iraq. Remember that? You'd have, yes, you'd have this laid one picture that I particularly liked. It was it's all these human bodies of Muslims. And she's standing on top of them, and one hand, and smoking a cigarette, getting a picture taken. They're naked. Others were people like your father or your brother. She to the wall and then to start a crucifixion course. Well, that was that was Claus's team. Claus was so successful that what he did in background that he got promoted. It's a corporate structure, you see. Move up the line. He moved to Guantanamo. It was so good there. He moved to Abu Ghraib. And when he walked in there, I, I remember some of the Senate reports, how could he walk in there? How could these people walk in there just take control of the prison? Because they were the A-team. And they had free reign of what they had to do. Even though after the Abu Ghraib, everybody ran for cover. But of course, didn't just run into trouble with Abu Ghraib. He had killed a Muslim taxi driver in background using the same interrogation techniques that he used on Omar Khadr. I've seen the pictures. Not pretty. And so what Claus would do, that whatever happens to Omar ha happened to every detainee. And remember, we're talking about the hospital, we're talking about Guantanamo. Yeah. And so and Omar, with all the troops coming out of him, he would be put, made to sit up without any medication being given to him, pain medication. And then with his blind eye and, pain, and the suffering he had, and we're just talking, you know, a week after coming off that horrible battlefield and being shot, they would shine lights into his eye with a little touch, he'd scream for pain, and then they'd ask questions. That was when he woke up. It got better for him. When he was able to get off the bed, because then you go into the interrogation room. And in the interrogation room, they would, they would mock him, laugh him, threaten him. They would, they would do the crucifixion pose, but in a different, but facing them, the guys, facing Claus. I think Claus like little boys. I'd love him to be here to hear me say that, because I've met him. And uh, so he would have Omar naked. 15 years of age, standing on his tiptoes, stretched as far as he can with all his pain and body damaged. And when this young boy scared and peed himself, that's when he got lit down. And then we take his head and use his hair as a mop. Those stories can go on and on and on. Not just for home run. Muslims. I always made that point. It's not for white guys that go to Guantanamo. It's for Muslims. It's a war against Muslims. No American 
ever went to Guantanamo Bay, even if a terrorist. Guantanamo Bay is not good enough for an American citizen who commits alleged terrorism acts. It certainly was good enough for this 15-year-old Canadian Muslim boy. And then you had the usual paraphernalia of misuse, and, uh, of Omar who would have a, a, a sack over his head and be tightened, and then have dogs barking into his face, which is quite scary. But for Omar, what was even worse than the dogs, I guess if anything's worse, was that they would make sure to tighten it so much he thought he was choking. And this, whole, and this whole process was designed to make him scared, hopeless, and do what we tell you. And, and you, there's not a Guantanamo detainee, we spent a long time in Guantanamo, we will not be able will not tell you if you must meet one. I know you I know you could British detainees, I know them all about Guantanamo, but they were never. Literally, you get hundreds and hundreds of delegations. Just like Omar. Because Omar was told, you killed Spear. You killed Spear. And after a while of keeping you at it, particularly when I'm harming you, I ask you, who did you kill? Spear. And I make sure I brainwash you now. You're an automaton. And the interesting thing about Clause, which I, a quote which I always kept, was he acknowledged that he did use these crude interrogation techniques more often with Kyler, he said, than with other detainees. More often with a, a little boy than with adults. And so I always say, well, I remember when it hit me that Bagram Hospital, that each bed was a torture chamber. I remember it hit me when I uh, uh, left Guantanamo having met Omar, maybe for the third time, because it took a while to get into talking about abuses. And I fought into Jacksonville, Florida, and all these imageries that I've just described to you are going through my head. And I wasn't crying. I mean, I wasn't sobbing, but I was crying. I had this sort of sobbing. Just, I, just, I walked to floor. I wanted to reach out to someone to talk to. Who could I, who could I speak to, to about, do you know what I now understand is going on? You know, and I remember calling one of my partners. He was busy to get going. Because he it was beyond him. He wasn't he was one of my best friends. I, I never said this to him. But, uh, but I felt so disappointed because that day I needed someone. But it was beyond him. Imagine someone calling you out in blue and telling you about the most basic indignities. The most basic of human to people that that you know are over there. It's real. Tough to pass that on to someone else to, and then to understand it. And so the abuses that Omar experienced in Guantanamo in background continued in Guantanamo. Um, I'll give you just two quick anecdotes. Remember Omar said to me one time, Dennis, he said, you know, before we went on the plane to be transferred to Guantanamo, we didn't get fed for days. And little sips of water. Thought about it, thought about it, and then I understood it. Because you're put into these other jumpsuits, which are straight jackets, you can't move. And you and you you're chained on the floor. Now have you none of you been in a military plane, but let me tell you, when the military carrier planes are horrible. I sat on chairs. I had ugly on the floor. It's always bumping And so in those polished jumpsuits, you're lying on the floor, chained, top, bottom, hooded, and you don't move from that spot 
from the moment you leave Afghanistan, crossing the ocean all the way to the southern tip of Cuba. And you don't get fed food, you only got sips of water because we don't want you to use emotion. My dogs, I have two lovely lab dogs. They are treated far more humanely than those human beings. And when they got off, what do you do with carriage when it gets off a Guantanamo? What do you do with your luggage? You throw it on the back of a truck. And then you unload it outside this detention center as part of an assembly of moving prisoners on. And old man will tell you, as many others have told me, that what you do is I get you up and I stand you against this wall and then they have a technique of grabbing you and just smashing you against the wall and you fall unconscious and then they bring you back up again. Welcome to Kipo. And he was 50. And so, and it changed me. I talked to him in my heart when I said this. I'm not a human rights lawyer. I never even started off to do human rights. I was a constitutional lawyer, criminal lawyer, um, did a fair number of high profile cases. Um, so I had a certain confidence about myself. But I remember coming out of Guantanamo thinking, I gotta do something. I'm damned, I'm gonna do something. Which was big talk. What was I gonna do? Take on the American government, the Great Empire, take on the Canadian government? Shit, no. I had to do something. And I ended up taking on both successfully. We don't end here. Throw my car is still in jail. And all the while, all this is going on, the Canadian government persisted in telling the Canadian public, that they've been assured that Omar is being treated humanely and that they would take the United States at its word. When other Western countries, including your own, were less accepting of US assurances. Those countries, including your own, demanded and were granted a return of every one of the detainees except this one national in Guantanamo, England can. Um, but they were adults, every one of them. While the Canadian government sent the message, we're not interested in this young boy. Do what you want with him. And so they abandoned him, abandoned him to hell. And even although the Canadian Supreme, Supreme Court, I, I was successful in the US Supreme Court, once successful in the Canadian Supreme Court twice. And even though the, the Canadian, support, Canadian Supreme Court ruled that the US, the only Western, the only court has directly challenged the United States. It said the U.S. had violated the Geneva Conventions and the Inter International Convention on Torture with regards to Omar Khadr. And then it continued and it said, and Canada had been complicit in that conduct. My country, I left Scotland, travelled a fair bit, ended up in Canada brought my children up there, married, and here I find that my own government is not just manipulating, not just abusing, but torturing a young, alone, 15-year-old boy. And Canada is also one of the drafters and the first signatories of the optional protocol on, to the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Convention of the Rights of the Child, dear students who all want to be lawyers, is the most signed on treaty in the world. It's that treaty that says we treat little kiddies a bit different than we treat our adults. Only two countries have not signed on to it. One is the failed state of Somalia and the other is good old U.S. And why? Because of the fact that if they were to ratify many of those treaties that they're involved in, they'd be accountable. That's why they're not in the criminal court of justice. 
and Omar Khadr is, the, is believed to be the only child soldier put in trial in modern history. Out of all those soldiers that were killed in Afghanistan, Omar Khadr is the only one made accountable. Can you see the irony in that? A 15 year old guy made accountable for all the sins of the soldiers that got killed. And I remember saying to this prosecutor, because one day he knocked me, he said to me um, in a very southern accent, how's your boy doing? And, and, and whatever I said to him, but in, in any event, what I said to him, you know, I would have thought with the war on terror, all those people, 700 plus, you got locked up here. And you talk about the worst of the worst. <laughs> There'd been somebody worse than Omar Khan. Is he the head of the town? The guy looked to me with absolute disgust. Because you tell him logic on his head, don't you? Yeah. So I say to you, that my Canadian government, along with many others, who all want to join in the war on terror with the Americans and sort of benefit from them, my government, by its actions, has demonstrated a shocking, reckless, and ruthless disregard for those moral and legal laws and their application that we assume to protect us when faced with a government determined to follow a contrary path. I sadly describe international law as being all pretty, all dressed up, but really nowhere to go. This generation, you and me, two different generations here, we've had the most sophisticated development of international laws, treaties and conventions the international community has ever known. And all state in the same thing, that human rights abuses will not be tolerated. And as a signatory to these treaties, Canada or the United States or Britain have an obligation to protest when one of their own had not been applied those rights under those international treaties. Yet my government continues to pick and choose, as others do, uh, would help. You know, I emphasize the Muslim aspect time and time again. I was in San Francisco speaking to all these distinguished people, um, judges, lawyers, students, blah, blah, blah. And I got the plane and I, I'm always running on empty. And I start off by saying, you know, all Muslims are terrorists. And I've got this cynical Scottish humor. I think it's funny. No one else picks it up. <laughs> and I said, oh, what's not terrorists? Oh, and I said, if they're not terrorists, they're not somebody who is a terrorist. Makes sense, we understand. But I mean, I said, it doesn't matter. We're all going to become terrorists eventually. Now, I think they've ready to give me throwing me out. But I challenge every one of them. When you go through an airport, particularly in the early days, it's a white Anglo-Saxon guy, I'm a happy. I'm glad I'm not Muslim, because it gets singled out. I'm glad I'm not Muslim, because the language is all about picking on a particular group, as we've done historically. We need a group. I said, who is it? Go, Joseph Goebbels. I know you that way. But, uh, he went for, for Hitler. He said, we can make society do anything, we just need two things. Target. The theory. Jews, the God, they're ripping us all off. But I, I've seen early documentaries of um, that, um, movie and propaganda against Jews where they showed little rats running through um, this, this um, basement. And then tell you, this is what Jews are like. They create that symbolism. Very simple, very powerful, very easy. We do the same every day. 
we don't stop to think about how the message keeps getting sent to us. And we don't challenge them. I say to you that these are hard times. And my legal journey of being successful in numerous courts. Truly, you got lots of money hiring me. Uh, I have Supreme Courts, Federal Courts, you name it. Never lost one. Until I went to Guantanamo. And then I never won a single thing. So you can't rush out and hire me. So we are witnesses. We are witnesses to habeas corpus being abandoned. Secret courts being created to hear secret evidence. Guilt inferred by association. I should all the time. That's what intelligence is all about. Who did you speak to last night? Why? Do you know who his brother is? No? Well, do you know his brother has a friend who knows someone else? So why are you talking to him? Torture and rendition, nakedly justified. Renditions in their vocabulary now. We never knew what rendition I never knew what rendition was until over the last past few years. And vital, vital international conventions consolidated in the aftermath of the Second World War. The Geneva Conventions, the Refugee Convention. I particularly like the Refugee Convention. In Canada, we, we, we used to be proud of inviting refugees in because you thought refugees were people who were troubled and needed help. A hug when they got off the boat, a bit of food. But now, we know the reality. I know that refugees are at a huge impulse. Go right to the front. Go to see me me. And I know that amongst them are potential terrorists. So we lock them up, isolated from the main body of the society because until they satisfy our ideology, we can't trust them. And we've accepted that. And in my view, I would never have envisaged that the history of the new century would encompass the destruction and the distortion of fundamental legal and constitutional principles that have been placed since the 17th century. And I mean that so sincerely. I've been in law, I don't know, I won't tell you, over 20 years anyway. And you know, I used to lecture to people like you and I would say, use law, law is powerful. It's a great equalizer, tempers power. Want to fight with me? See you in court. We appear to have forgotten the lessons of the Star Chamber, where the accused were submitted to torture, talking 400 years ago, to accusations based on secret evidence, Star Chamber, held by a secret court, while being shackled in extremes of isolation. That's what the Star Chamber was about hundreds of years ago. And every one of those examples are present everyday examples. It's almost over. I do the sing song later. <laughs> there are seats come, over here, come. there are seats over here. How did you do it finished? And when I talk about shackled, and all the years that I've got to Guantanamo, I never saw Omar walk. I, I have grown up with Omar exactly like this. I sit in a cell. Omar sits on a chair next to me. He's shackled to the floor. Sometimes if he's really lucky, he's not handcuffed. And as a young boy, He's grown up to a grown man. He was 26 when he left my town. So 
so I watched this kid grow up. And he could never be but never able to walk with each other. In fact, a more contemporary example of freedom for him was when I was able to, to persuade the uh, Canadian Correctional Services to transfer him to a prison post to, to where I live. And he called me. He was so excited because he got in this van only for him. And a little window. And he could see the tar on the road. He could see trucks. And he could see green. That was his first observation of the outside world. And the happiest time he's having in his life is right now. Because he's in hospital. And we're trying to save from going completely paralyzed on the left side of his body. And my wife has been approved to go to that hospital, even though he's still shackled to a bed, even though there's two big crews of guards in, in, in the ward, and my wife brings him anything he wants. He is happy. He has never had those kind of treats. So I say to you, we appear to have forgotten the lessons of the Star Chamber. And the worst excesses of the past year should have sounded loud alarms. In the past year, should have sounded alarms. Well, as to you guys, you young people, but to your damn professors, to your damn lawyers, to your damn parents, to civil society, to your churches, Because they don't act. They don't do anything. And it's you. And we've left you a mess. And you may end up just like we are. Apathetic. Or you may start to fight. And I'll tell you. If you don't, you're in real trouble. And I say that to you. And I say that to you. And I say that to you. It's not naive to believe that we can affect change, real change, through cooperation with each other, through advocacy, through the ballot box. But it's naive to think we can sit back and we'll get it. Truly. And don't think there's going to be huge masses of people that are going to come and support you in an army. I'm a great example of that. I'd be on a pro bono journey for, oh, I don't know, I'm going on 11 years now. Now, you know, I said the one talk I had here was I'm a Queen's Council, which means I'm something. I'm also a bench. I'm at the top, the pinnacle of law society. You can't get any further than me. People are shooting each other in the streets in these in these chambers to get where I'm at. I go for dinners with judges and lawyers and they all want to be with me. Check me out on Google. See my name everywhere. Pat me on the back. Great stuff. Keep up the good work. And I've cried. I cry. For them to get off their bum and do something. If we had cooperation, politics, the law. Because I said to you when I started off, I didn't know what I'm doing. But I brought attention to Guantanamo Bay. I brought attention to many things through the courts. And they can't mess around with me because I don't do any bad stuff. You know? I'm a lawyer. Mess with me, I'll see you in court. And every politician has got a little office. I know years ago, and you talked, sir, about hundreds of thousands of people protesting and no one complained. I'd have taken those guys, forget the protest, I know, I like this, forget the protest in the street, protest at the door of every politician. 
and he goes home on the weekend, be there. When he goes to his office, be there. And let him know that you're going to speak to your five closest friends, we're going to speak to their five closest friends, and all you're going to work for all year is to make sure he never gets re-elected. I guarantee you, you would see change coming so quickly, within three years, because that's when they run again. And I, and I target politicians, because that's where the battle is between intellect, rule of law, and legislation being passed for your protection by governments who are interested in their own self-serving interests. And so our rights, as I conclude here, are being infringed more and more on every side. And the danger, the real danger of it all, is that we become used to it. Take Snowden, for example. He's a hero. What did he do? He gave you information to tell you that we're all being watched in every, every personal aspect of our life. But I could take you to the States where people quite properly, in their mind anyway, think that he should go to jail because he gave up national security. He put us at risk. It's that bullshit ideology that we've bought into that we need to be kept safe. Who's going to keep you safe when you cross a road? No one can keep you safe. There's always idiots somewhere. 9-11. There's never been another incident back in the United States except some guy, and I, was, I was there a few days afterwards, who left a car with a, a little bomb in it. That happens. You know? It can't be protected. We have to get on. I spoke with a lady. I'm going too far. I spoke with a lady who lost her daughter. Twin Towers. And what was, and I wrote about it. And what did she say? It's time to move on. And we're not moving on. For years now, we spent millions and trillions of dollars to protect us all from the enemy without. Now we're talking about the enemy within. Who are you mixed with? What is your ideology? You better not be have this, you better not argue against my viewpoint. Ideology tells me who you are, as if I have no ideology. So the story of Omar Khan is I'll be quiet. It's not just about a young boy who was attained and abused. His story to me anyway is all about how we, you and I, as individuals, define ourselves. Find yourself. Who do you think you are? How do you feel about yourself? Is that the kind of value you want to be? You want to walk away? How low do you go and allow power to control you and everything else? What are you prepared to stand up for? And I say to you today, more than I say to adults, I know you're adults, I know you're growing up, God, I got kids who tell me the same thing. But I, a lot of us are on our journey out. Scottish depression coming up here. It's your world. You, you're taking over. You're inheriting it. And you've got problems. When I read in the paper, here, keep going on here. When you have five families or ten families that have as much money as 30% of the population of this country, my God, what does that say to you? When are you going to get angry? And when you get angry, just in case CSIS is listening or, or whoever in talks nations, when you get angry, really get angry, but use the rule of law. It's the idiot that uses this. Because then you're, you're marshmallows. You picked up easy. Use, use those fundamental rights. It's hard to be challenged. It's hard to be knocked down. And while you're fighting about it's fundamental rights. That we have a civil society, that we treat people fairly, honestly, that we have dignity, like people have dignity. Hard to argue against that. And when you're banging on the door of your politician and he thinks you're a nuisance, just think of the publicity you can get. All I'm asking them to do 
is to with the teachings of Allah and the teachings of Jesus and teachings of whoever, Muhammad, whoever, I don't know, I stay out of churches. Um, was fundamental basic truths of humanity. Hard to be picked on. So, I'm finished. So, as I conclude then, embedded in my talk today has been the responsibility, the imperative, to stand against injustice. Our responsible, you responsible, every one of you's responsibility as human beings is to speak out to the reality of inhumanity. To speak out against the moral hollowness of political inaction. Because the only crime in my respectful view, equal to willful inhumanity, is the crime of indifference, the crime of silence, or the crime of just simply forgetting. Thanks for your patience. Taken a lot away from what Dennis has said today. Um, we're just going to open up for question questions now. So if anyone wants to pose a question from Dennis, we've also had some questions um, on our Facebook page, which I'll bring out if anyone wants to go first. Yep. in newspapers? Absolutely. I keep saying that. I keep saying, you're getting one message. It's time to give another message. I am. I, uh, I loved, I, I organized this um, conference a number of years ago in Toronto on the politics of fear. And I had different Muslim Christians and different groups. And what was more powerful? Was the, when you talk about Muslims, was the fact that the, the people don't realize, and I don't know what I'm with this, that Muslims are Scottish, they're Australian, and so on. We think the world is so small, and we become part of that small world. It's time to make it bigger. You communicate with people here, Asia, to my boss. Me, 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 my boss. Um, Arth, have some home. Let's leave some bread. <laughs> Seriously, 
there's power in numbers. And you're far more powerful today than when I started. It's just me throwing my way up and down courtrooms and in little halls and big halls and whatever. You can communicate, you can make all the time on that internet, that web. And the message passes quickly. I'm saying to you, that's what you do. You just challenge the values. And you just have to ask, ask your politician, for example, it, um, my local politician won't even let me come in the door. I've never met her. Never had an opportunity to talk to her. And I'm too busy to take her on. But I always point her out to everybody in my neighborhood not to vote for her. And so obviously I come from a middle class neighborhood, so obviously that's affected her. But I can tell you, the day she starts to see her numbers goes down, it's the day she'll be calling me. I have met prime ministers. I've met all kinds of high profile people. And the former prime minister of Canada, Paul Martin, I met him in Quebec. And um, I said to him that I'd read his book, he's retired as a prime minister, which was a lie. I read a glimpse of the book in a free bookstore. And I said to him, you said in your book that had you known then what you, what you know now, you've done something different. So I asked you to stand up. And he, like oh, so many, many politicians I've, I've met, they all say the right thing. Would you be on the sound bites? There's nothing there. So don't trust him. Take control. I take control. I was flying to flying to uh, Argentina to work on the Memory Commission, where people had tremendous tortures had taken place by previous junters. And I was catching a connecting flight in Chile. And this politician, former cabinet minister for the, the Conservative government, called my name. David Kilgour, Dennis, how are you? And I said, fine, David. I said, you know, I'd be mean to call you. I said, well, David, it's taken you seven years. So I've been there. So through me, you could learn. Don't waste your time. It's a full of bullshit. Tell him what you want. Tell him what you want him to see him do. And what you're asking him is not illegal. You're asking him to, to protect the civil liberties of your neighbors and your friends. And, I, and, and read up about civil liberties. Read up about things so when you talk to him, he, when you get beyond his little sound bites or the little little bio that he's been given to make you sound good, there's nothing behind it. You, the leaders of today, take control. Sorry, that was a long answer. Um, my question is, uh, your lecture was timely. Um, do you just want to say I'm not going to go near Mozambique, but here's what I will tell you. I know Boyd Mozambique well. I think he's a lovely man. I think he's done great work. He's been an inspiration to me. Um, but I don't think um, that, that I can go further than that. Um, the, when you, I just talked about ideologies. <coughs> Lack of freedom of speech. I know about ideologies. <coughs> My father was a Protestant in Scotland, and my mother was a Catholic, and, he never, and everybody hated us. There was nothing worse than my mother being a prostitute, she'd been more respected. So I understand ideologies. But you know what? Whether you're Catholic or whether you're Protestant, you should be able to speak to each other like your, your different viewpoints. Whether you're Muslim or whether you're Christian, we're now using ideologies as a way to make sure that we like you. And particularly the Muslim community. We like you because you think like us. And um, it's a problem. Anybody else? Thank you very much. Shall I just say something um, which perhaps helps this young lady and others? Your local MP has a duty to see you. If you want to make an appointment with your local MP, they have a duty to see you. Let them refuse, and then what are they going to do? You can tell them the story, face to face, 
you don't actually have to write to them. And your local MP is your contact. Don't waste your time with David Cameron or William Hayes sure. or anything like that. That's bullshit, all right? I, I accept it. So, all of you, you have a right to go and see your local MP and tell them about it. And don't, and don't go alone. <laughs> you know? And it isn't just a Muslim issue. It's a human rights issue. I know it's a Muslim issue. And most of you are Muslim here. But it is a human rights issue. I'm Jewish, all right? What I don't know about human rights isn't worth knowing. We don't human rights issue. Don't be afraid to tell them.